Please be seated. You can be seated. Thank you.
Yes, sir. Attorney Smith, Attorney Brooks, ready? Yes, sir. Right. We'll bring the jurors in now. Bring them in. Please rise for the jury. for the jury. I'll ask the jurors to please remain standing. Everyone else, you may be seated. Members of the jury, I'm going to swear you in now. So if you could please raise your right hands. And at the conclusion of the oath, if you would please say, I will. You so solemnly swear or affirm that you will carefully consider the evidence and the law presented to you in this case, and that you will deliver a fair and true verdict as to the charges or charges against the defendant. So help you God. Amen. Thank you. Members of the jury, you can be seated. I'm going to uh, now read the charges to you in this matter. There's five charges. The first is charge ID 1937947C. This states that Adam Montgomery of Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, of Manchester in the state of New Hampshire, between approximately July 1st and July 22nd, 2019, at Manchester in the county of Hillsborough aforesaid, did commit the crime of second degree assault in that Adam Montgomery did knowingly cause bodily injury to HM, date of birth, 6-7-2014, a child under the age of 13 by striking her in the face. Said acts being contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the state. The next charge in this matter is charge ID 202-7112C, and this states that Adam Montgomery of Manchester in the state of New Hampshire on or about December 7th, 2019 at Manchester in the county of Hillsborough aforesaid did commit the crime of second degree murder in that Adam Montgomery did recklessly cause the death of Harmony, Harmony Montgomery, date of birth 6-7-2014, a person under 13 years of age under circumstances manifesting an extreme indifference to the value of human life by repeatedly, repeatedly striking Harmony Montgomery on the head with a closed fist. Said acts being contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the state. The next charge is charge ID 202-7113C. And this states that Adam Montgomery of Manchester in the state of New Hampshire between approximately December 7th, 2019 and March 4th, 2020 at Manchester in the county of Hillsborough aforesaid did commit the crime of falsifying physical evidence in that Adam Montgomery believing that an official proceeding as defined in RSA 641 colon one Roman numeral two or an investigation was pending or about to be instituted, did purposely alter, destroy, conceal, or remove the body of Harmony Montgomery with a purpose to impair its verity or availability in such proceeding or investigation. Said acts being contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the state. The next charge in this matter is charge ID 202-7114C. And this states that Adam Montgomery of Manchester, New Hampshire, at Manchester, between December 7th, 2019 and March 4th, 2020, did commit the offense of abuse of a corpse in that the defendant did purposely and unlawfully 
removed, concealed, or destroyed the corpse of Harmony Montgomery or any part thereof. And this is against the peace and dignity of the state. And then the last charge is charge ID 202-7115C. And this states that Adam Montgomery of Manchester in the state of New Hampshire between approximately December 7th, 2019 and January 4th, 2022 at Manchester in the county of Hillsborough <coughs> aforesaid did commit the crime of tampering with witnesses and informants in that Adam Montgomery believing that an official proceeding as defined in RSA 641 colon 1 Roman numeral 2 or investigation was pending or about to be instituted did purposely attempt to induce or otherwise cause Kayla Montgomery to testify or inform falsely said acts being contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the state ladies and gentlemen of the jury the defendant Adam Montgomery has been arraigned on these charges and he has pleaded not guilty and of this he puts himself upon his country for trial which country you are Assistant Attorneys General Benjamin Agati and Christopher Knowles for the state have joined the issue and you are to say by your verdict if the defendant Adam Montgomery is guilty of the crimes whereof he stands indicted or not guilty. Hearken to the evidence. Thank you. Members of the jury, shortly you will hear opening statements by counsel. Before that, I'm going to give you some general instructions as to the law that applies to this case and some other matters which will give you some guidance as you consider the evidence in this case. After you have heard the evidence and you have heard closing arguments, you will hear further instructions from the court and then you will retire to the jury deliberation room to decide your verdict. You should consider all of the instructions I give you, both now and at the end of the case as a whole, and not single out one particular instruction as stating the law. You will also have written copies of my instructions with you in the jury deliberation room. So ladies and gentlemen, this is not a memory test. Uh, what I ask of you now is just listen carefully to the instructions that I give to you. You will have as many copies as you like in the deliberation room when it comes to decide your verdict. So you will have written copies of both the instructions that I give you now as well as the ones that I give you at the end of the case as a whole. And every juror can have one available to them. So please just listen carefully now as I give you these instructions. The function of the court and the jury. In order to reach a fair and just verdict, you must understand and follow the law as I explain it to you. For example, you have to understand the definitions of the crimes with which the defendant is charged. You have to understand how convinced one way or the other you should be before deciding your verdict. You have to understand what to consider in deciding whether to believe a particular witness. These instructions will explain the law as to these and other matters so that you can reach a fair and just verdict. It is your duty as jurors to follow all of the instructions I am about to give you. Regardless of any opinion you may have as to what the law ought to be, the law as I explain it to you is the law you must follow in reaching your verdict. It is up to you to decide the facts. You must decide the facts solely from the evidence in this trial. You must apply the law given to you in these instructions to the facts and in this way reach a fair and just verdict. You should decide the facts without prejudice, without fear, and without sympathy. You should decide this case based solely on the evidence presented and the law as I explain it to you. The evidence in the case. In deciding this case, you should consider only the evidence in the case. The evidence consists of testimony under oath of the witnesses, exhibits which have been admitted into evidence, facts of which I take judicial notice, and stipulations of certain facts. During the trial, the lawyers may make objections. The lawyers are supposed to object when they believe that certain evidence is not admissible. If I sustain an objection or exclude any evidence, you must not guess as to what the answer or evidence would have been. If I order that a question and answer be stricken from the record, you must not consider either the question or the answer as evidence. A judge is required to be neutral, and I am in fact neutral. 
if during this trial or at any point during these proceedings you believe that I have expressed or suggested an opinion as to the facts in my rulings, you should ignore that belief. It is up to you alone to decide the facts. In short, you should consider only the legally admissible evidence in deciding this case, that is, the testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits, stipulations, and facts of which I took judicial notice. We talked earlier that there will be a view in this case, and I'll give you uh, an instruction on the view later, but the view is also evidence in the case, but uh, you'll hear an instruction on that in a little bit. The indictments are not evidence. The fact that the defendant has been arrested and indicted is not evidence of guilt. The indictments are simply a way of giving the defendant notice of the charges. The indictments are a formal way of accusing the defendant of a crime in order to bring the defendant to trial. You must not consider the indictments as evidence of guilt. Multiple indictments, one defendant. Each of the indictments against the defendant constitutes a separate offense. You must consider each indictment separately and determine whether the state has proven the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The fact that you may find the defendant guilty or not guilty on one of the indictments should not influence your verdict with respect to the other indictments. The possible punishment the defendant may receive if you return a guilty verdict should not influence your decision. The duty of imposing sentence is solely for the judge. You should base your verdict only on the evidence and the law without considering the possible punishment. The presumption of innocence. As you were instructed during the general selection process, there is a presumption of innocence that applies and continues throughout this trial until the state convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of each and every element of the offenses with which he has been charged. And the defendant has no obligation whatsoever to prove his innocence in this matter. And that includes the right not to testify if he so chooses. You are not allowed to draw any unfavorable, adverse, or negative inference if the defendant does not take the stand in this matter. The jury's recollection controls. You will hear the lawyers discuss the facts and the law in their opening statements and closing arguments to you. These statements and arguments are not evidence. Their purpose is to help you understand the evidence and the law. If the lawyers have stated the law differently from the law as I explain it to you in these instructions, then you must follow these instructions and ignore the statements of the lawyers. If the lawyers state the evidence differently from how you recall it, then you should follow your own memory of what the evidence was. Direct and circumstantial evidence. There are two kinds of evidence, direct and circumstantial. Direct evidence is direct proof of a fact, such as the testimony or statement of a person about what the person saw, heard, or did. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence, that is, proof of a chain of facts from which you could find that another fact exists, although it has not been proved directly. For example, if you look outside and see water droplets falling from the sky, that is direct evidence that it's raining. But if you look out the window at night and the ground is dry, and again the next morning and the ground is wet, that is indirect or circumstantial evidence that it rained during the night. By circumstantial evidence, I simply mean that you may infer the ultimate fact from another fact shown. You should feel free to reach reasonable conclusions from proven facts. Conversely, you may not reach conclusions based on facts that have not been proved. In the rain example, wet ground alone may support an inference that it rained during the night. But in the absence of additional evidence, it will not necessarily support inferences about how much rain fell or for how long a period of time. You should consider both kinds of evidence. You are permitted to give equal weight to both, but it is for you to decide how much weight to give any evidence, whether it be direct or circumstantial. However, to be sufficient to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, circumstantial evidence must exclude all other rational conclusions. 
This means that if from the circumstantial evidence it is rational to arrive at two conclusions, one consistent with guilt and one consistent with innocence, then you must choose the rational conclusion consistent with innocence. In determining whether all rational conclusions other than guilt have been excluded, you should not consider any item of circumstantial evidence in isolation. Rather, you should consider each item of circumstantial evidence in the context of all of the other evidence, which includes all other circumstantial evidence and direct evidence. You must understand, however, that this circumstantial evidence rule does not apply to direct evidence. If there is a conflict between two or more witnesses who offer direct evidence concerning certain facts, you should resolve the conflict. For example, suppose there are two eyewitnesses to a crime, and one testifies that the defendant committed the crime, and the other testifies that the defendant did not commit the crime. This presents a situation where there is a conflict in direct evidence. In this situation, you, the jury, should resolve the conflict and must decide whether, based upon all of the evidence, the state has proved the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. You should consider all of the direct and circumstantial evidence in the case, as well as any reasonable inferences you draw therefrom, in deciding whether the state has proved all of the elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. The credibility of witnesses. In deciding this case, you must decide the credibility of witnesses. That is, it is up to you to decide who to believe. If there is any conflict between the witnesses, then you must resolve the conflict. Simply because a witness has taken an oath to tell the truth does not mean that you have to accept the testimony as true. Use your common sense and judgment. Consider factors you use in deciding important issues in your everyday lives. For example, you may consider the following. The witness's attitude, behavior, and appearance on the stand and the way the witness testifies. The witness's age, intelligence, and experience. The witness's opportunity and ability to see or hear the things about which the witness testifies. The accuracy of the witness's memory. Any motive of the witness not to tell the truth. Any interest that a witness has in the outcome of the case. Any bias of the witness or friendship or animosity the witness may have for or against any of the other people in the case. The consistency or inconsistency of the witness's testimony. Whether or not what the witness says appears reasonable or unreasonable. Whether what the witness says is consistent or inconsistent with the testimony of other witnesses or with statements the witness made at another time. In deciding which witness to believe and how much of their testimony to believe, you should consider both the direct and cross-examination of the witnesses. If you believe that part of a witness's testimony is false, you may choose to distrust other parts also, but you are not required to do so. Inconsistencies and contradictions within a witness's testimony or between witnesses do not necessarily mean that you should disbelieve the witness. It is possible for honest people to witness the same event and see or hear things differently. You should evaluate inconsistencies and contradictions and determine whether they are important or unimportant. You need not believe any witness even though the testimony is uncontradicted. Nor are you required to accept testimony as true because some or even all of the witnesses agree with each other. You may find the testimony of one witness or of a few witnesses more persuasive than the testimony of a larger number. These principles apply to all witnesses, whether they are ordinary citizens, police officers, experts, or otherwise. In short, you should consider the testimony of each witness and give it the weight you think it deserves. The weight to be given to the evidence should be determined by the quality of the evidence, not the quantity. It is not the number of witnesses or the quantity of the evidence, but the quality of the evidence that is important. The judge decides what is admissible. 
testimony, writing, objects, and other things presented during the trial are evidence only if the judge accepts them as evidence. Throughout the trial, I may rule on whether certain evidence was admissible or not admissible. These are legal decisions which do not concern you because only the judge is permitted to decide legal questions. I may make three types of legal decisions with regard to the evidence. First, I may stop some information from being presented at all. You are not to imagine what that information might have been had I allowed it to be presented. Second, I may rule that some information was not admissible after it was presented to you. You are to ignore this information and not use it as evidence. Finally, I may allow some information to be entered as evidence after hearing objections by one of the lawyers. You are not to give such evidence any special importance as a result of my ruling. It is not my duty and I do not try to determine whether the evidence is important when I make my rulings. The burden of proof and reasonable doubt. Now I've addressed what you should not consider and what you should consider in reaching a verdict. I'm now going to discuss with you how convinced one way or the other you must be, and this is referred to as the burden of proof. Under our constitutions, all defendants in criminal cases are presumed to be innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proving guilt is entirely on the state. The defendant does not have to prove his innocence. As I told you earlier, the defendant enters the courtroom as an innocent person and you must consider him to be an innocent person until the state convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt that he is guilty of every element of the alleged offense. If after all of the evidence and arguments, you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant having committed any one or more elements of the offense, then you must find him not guilty. Now finally, ladies and gentlemen, a reasonable doubt is what the words would ordinarily imply. The use of the word reasonable means simply that the doubt must be reasonable rather than unreasonable. It must be a doubt based upon reason. It is not a frivolous or fanciful doubt, nor is it one that can easily be explained away. Rather, it is such a doubt based on reason as remains after consideration of all of the evidence that the state has offered against it. The test you must use is this. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proven any one or more elements of the crime charged, you must find the defendant not guilty. However, if you find the state has proven all of the elements of the charged offense beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. With respect to the final instructions regarding the offenses, I will wait until the end of the trial and after closing arguments and discuss it with you at that time. So as I said, I will give you another set of instructions after closing arguments at the end of this case. You will have all of these instructions with you in the deliberation room when it comes time to decide your verdict. As I said to you earlier, uh, there's a form of this instruction that I'm about to give you. We call it the communication instruction that I'll give you. I've given you some of it before and I'll continue to give it throughout the trial. Please listen very carefully. Do not discuss the case at all, not with the other members of the jury or with anyone else, until jury deliberations start at the end of the trial after all of the evidence and final arguments have been presented. Please keep an open mind until you have heard all of the evidence in the case. During the course of trial, please take care to avoid any contact with any persons involved in the case, the lawyers, the witnesses, and the parties. So I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, as you come in and out of the courthouse, you may see the lawyers or other people involved in the case. They have been instructed that they are not to communicate with you, so they are not being rude if they don't acknowledge your presence or smile at you or say hello uh, as you may pass them in the hallways. Um, but you must, uh, they are required to avoid any contact with you and you re are required to avoid any contact with them. So no contact uh, with anyone involved in the case, please. Also, please be sure to avoid any television, radio, online, or newspaper coverage of this case. 
Uh, I anticipate that there will be media coverage of this case. As I indicated earlier, you know that there are cameras in the courtroom. They have been instructed that they are not to take pictures of the jurors in the case. Um, but I expect that there will be media coverage. You are instructed that you must not read any articles or view any media coverage on television, online, or elsewhere. So avoid your local papers. Uh, have somebody pull the international section if you want. Um, but don't watch any media coverage of the case, okay? Um, you are instructed to turn off any notification or banners that come through your smartphone, computers, smartwatches, or other devices, okay? Uh, finally, do not conduct any research or investigation of your own. You must render your verdict based solely on the evidence submitted at trial. So don't look up the law. That will be given to you in the court's instructions. Don't drive by any locations. Don't look up any names. Don't look anybody up on social media. It is critically important that your verdict in this case is based exclusively on the evidence that's presented at trial. Our trial day will generally go from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. We will also generally take a mid-morning and mid-afternoon break. I try to look at sort of natural, for natural break points in the case to determine when those breaks happen. Um, but generally, we'll have a mid-afternoon, mid-morning break, and we'll also have a, a lunch break. The court has asked you to put your cell phones in a box in the jury deliberation room. Please make sure they are silenced or turned off altogether. As I said to you, you will be permitted to check your phones when you are on break. However, you are not to look at any news reporting or media coverage of this case, as I have already told you. Additionally, you are not permitted to take notes of any kind, not on paper nor on your phones. The reason for this is that it is important that your recollection of the evidence is what controls. Sometimes if notes are taken, they can be given undue weight, and it's important that when it comes time to deliberate, you are using your individual and collective memories about the evidence, and one note or one written recollection doesn't control. You should also be aware that there will be no transcript available to you when it comes time to deliberate. So although we have our excellent court monitors here uh, and there's an audio recording that is not uh, available to the jurors and there will be no transcript. So your individual and collective recollection is what will control as you go into the uh, deliberations. Therefore, please listen carefully to the evidence as it is presented. If during the course of this trial you have any questions or problems, you become thirsty or need anything else, just get the court officer's attention, either of our court officers or my attention, so that we can assist you. If at any time during the trial you cannot hear, please raise your hand so that I can ask the witness or the lawyers to speak up. That goes uh, as well for any uh, monitors. If you cannot see, please do let us know. It is important that you are viewing and listening to all of the evidence as it's presented. So ladies and gentlemen, it is now 20 of. Um, I had indicated to you earlier that I thought we would go right into opening statements. But based on what I anticipate, the length of the opening statements will be, I think that would hold your lunch off for quite a long time. So um, after speaking with the lawyers, I think what we're going to do is I'm gonna, we'll take an early lunch break. So we're going to break now. Uh, please come back at, um, in one hour, so 20 to 1 and then we'll move directly into opening statements. So don't talk about the case, not with each other, not with anybody else. Uh, don't look at any media, don't do any independent research, and I will see you in an hour after lunch. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. All rise for the jurors. Be seated. Um, do you have an, anything preliminary, or do you want to just come back at 12:30, or what, what? What would you like to do? Just thinking we're on a with regards to the arrangements for the bus. Maybe if we could approach on that. Sure.
Please be seated. Council, can you approach for just a minute, please?
seated. Council approach. All rise for the jurors, please. All rise for the jury. Maybe seated. All right, sorry for the delay, ladies and gentlemen. Um, one thing I think you will learn as you go through this process is some things, sometimes things go exactly as we plan, uh, and sometimes they do not. Right now, they are not going exactly as we had previously planned, so I apologize for the delay. Uh, and you know, there are a lot of moving parts in a trial, so sometimes we need to switch things up. Um, so. Originally, I had said that we were going to come in and do opening statements. Um, we're going to do something a little different than that. As I said, we're going to be going on a view today. So prior to a view, the lawyers will give you a what's called a preview statement to give you some information about uh, where they want you to, what they want you to look at, and what they anticipate that you will see on the view. Um, we're going to do that first. So I'm going to give you a an instruction regarding the view, then the state and the defense will give you uh, their preview statements, okay? Um, so, and then we will uh, wait for the bus to come, and when everybody's ready, we'll get on the bus and we'll go for the view. And then depending on what time it is after that and other circumstances, we'll determine whether opening statements will be this afternoon after the view or whether they'll be uh, tomorrow, okay? So listen carefully to this instruction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to begin this case with a view. We will be traveling to several locations within the city of Manchester to observe certain areas you will be hearing testimony about. The purpose of the view is to make the testimony you will hear more understandable. If you have the opportunity to look at a scene, the testimony may make more sense to you. Your obligation on the view is to look as carefully as you can and to remember what you see as well as you can. You may not ask questions. You may not take any notes or measurements. You should look carefully at what the lawyers will be pointing out to you. What you see on the view is evidence in this case. Please stay as close together as possible so that you will all be viewing the scene from approximately the same perspective. If you cannot hear or see, please call that to my attention or to the attention of one of our court officers. After the view is completed, you may not revisit the scenes on your own during trial. Also, you may not engage in any discussion among yourselves or with anyone else concerning what you see at the view. As you know, you are not to talk with each other or with anyone else about the case until the end of the trial when you are conducting your deliberations. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, counsel will have the opportunity to make their preview statements to you concerning what they expect you will be seeing on the view. Yes, you may. Thank you. 
my first opportunity to talk to you as the jury, Big J, as opposed to the Little J. Um, let me thank you again for your time uh, that you're going to be putting forward not only today but throughout the trial. Um, it is very important uh, both to, this, to society, to the government, to the citizens, and it is very, very much appreciated. Um, the first part of your job, for the most part, is going to be taking place in this room. The vast majority of it dealing with the witnesses and the exhibits that you see. But as you just heard from Judge Messer, another part is going to be the view. This is evidence, what you're going to see today. Um, it is going to be work on the view. You're going to have to walk around in two different locations. And the rest of them will require you to look out the windows of a bus to be able to take into account the neighborhoods that you are in. And I'm going to explain every place that we're going to go in just a moment. And then Defense Counsel will also have that same opportunity. Together, we are going to see where this happened. You're going to get to see the same places, the same locations in person that you are later on going to see and hear evidence at trial. And you've already heard, again, Judge Messer's instruction. You should consider today's view to be like evidence. In a few minutes, we are going to get on a bus, maybe about now, and we're going to see a couple different locations in Manchester. In some ways, it's going to be the beginning of a journey that you will likely never forget. And this is also the last journey that Harmony Montgomery took while she was alive and where her body went afterwards. <coughs> it's a journey that's into the actions of the defendant on that day and the days forward. And we're going to drive by places where Harmony was first assaulted, where she was later killed, where she was later consolidated and crushed. And then finally, the different other locations of where the defendant had her in the city. What you are going to see today is part of the evidence. Some of the locations that we're going to drive by, we are just going to pass by in the bus for a minute, and the bus is going to pull over to the side of the road. So you have an opportunity to look at that location, take in the surroundings. And on two of the locations, we will physically get out. One will be a parking lot, and the other one will be an intersection. We will not be going into any residences. Later on, you're going to hear testimony about different homes. We may be driving by an apartment complex today, but we will not be going inside in the actual rooms where Harmony was or where Harmony later was kept. So we will be outside for the two times that we get out of the bus. So before we do that, I want to kind of start at the beginning. The first place that we're going to go to, and this is Ms. Johnson, forget my art skills, high school. We're going to start at the courthouse. And the first place that we're going to go to is we're going to go down past Elm Street. Definitely not to scale. We're going to come across Merrimack, and we're going to go up here on Market Street. And at that point, we're going to pull the bus over to the side of the road. And you're going to be able to look out, and I would say look out the right-hand side of the bus to the area of 20 Market Street. That's the location of the methadone clinic where the defendant took Harmony that morning with the rest of the family inside a 2010 gray Chrysler Sebring. You'll, when you're there, I want you to be able to take into account just the outside of the building and also look at the neighborhood. I want you to see the number of other businesses that are nearby, the number of other cars that are nearby, the uh, number of foot, uh, the amount of foot traffic that may be there while we're there. You're going to hear in opening arguments that it was at that first location outside the methadone clinic that the defendant came out from getting his medication, got into the car, and understood that Harmony had had an accident, saying words to the effect of really Harmony again. Objection, Your Honor. Approach.
Ladies and gentlemen, that objection is neither uh, is is neither sustained or withheld. The the, um, the state will clarify. Go ahead. When we're at that location later on, you're going to hear testimony that at that location when Adam came out from that location, your testimony that he sensed and smelled that at the bathroom, and that that's where the assaults began of striking. That's why it's important for you to look around to see what else and who else is there and to know what that area looks like. From there, we're going to then come back on to Elm Street, and we do a loop around. Go north on Elm, then we're going to go up to Webster Street, at the top of Elm, and that's right over where you get past where you would go on the bridge, the big Brady Sullivan Tower there. We're going to take Webster Street out, and here, we're going to go out on Daniel Webster Highway. And there, there's the Burger King. When we get to the Burger King, again, we won't be getting out of the bus, but we're staying inside, and you'll have a chance to look at that parking lot. What the state is asking you to do is to pay close attention during that drive. How many stoplights, roughly? Roughly, are we going through? What are the road conditions like? How long does it take to get there? You're going to hear testimony later on about that same drive. You're going to hear testimony how, during that drive, the defendant's assaults continued. And he continued to hit Harmony as they stopped at red lights, as they stopped at stop signs. That's why you need to take close, pay close attention during that drive. And we're going to go out to that location. After we've had a minute or two to sit in the bus there at Burger King, and you've had a chance to see the traffic close, see what cars are like. At that time, we're then going to turn around. We're going to come back down Webster, continue north on L, and then we're going to cut over. To an area on West River Drive, approximately 59 West River Drive. And there, we're going to make our first stop where we get out of the buses. 59 West River Drive is one of the street locations for Colonial Village Apartments. It's right up on the, you can see poorly drawn river. It's right on the backside there. We're going to be pulling in between those buildings and going to a very large back parking lot that's behind there. This is where you'll hear testimony that the defendant lived in his car after they had been evicted from the Guilford Street home and where the defendant kept Harmony and the rest of his family after they left Burger King, after he continued to hit her, and drove back there to eat his food while Harmony was moaning. You're going to hear testimony that that's where he used his drugs while Harmony died. When you're there, I'm asking you to notice the number of apartment buildings that are nearby. Look at the number of cars that are in the parking lot, how big that parking lot is. I'm also going to ask you to take notice in that back parking lot area, look towards the tree line. Look at the very back row, closest to the river, where different cars can park. Notice all of that while you're there. It's going to be more than one or two minutes. So you can get out, you can certainly walk around, take your time to really look in that area and look at the different details that are there. Um, also look up at the side of the building. I'd like you to know whether or not you see lights on the side of the building that illuminate that parking lot. There are street lights that illuminate that park. So do that while you're there. Once we're done, we'll get back on the bus and we're going to drive back towards the city, back on West River Road, back to Elm, and then south to the intersection with Webster. The buses are going to pull over on the side here, and we're going to get back out here again. You'll hear testimony that it was here that the defendant's Gray Sebring died in the intersection. That it was here that where, with his family, the car stopped working. And that it was here, just before he needed to get a tow, you'll hear how he went to the back seat and found that Harmony was no longer alive. I want you to look very closely around that intersection. Look at the traffic going through that intersection. The number of people that were available at that intersection. 
we're also going to hear the testimony that at that time, when he realized that she was dead, that when you look at the different businesses around, I want you to remember that when later on you're hearing testimony, how his actions was to take Harmony and to stuff her in a duffel bag. You'll also hear later a trial from a tow truck driver, and you'll hear about a gas station on the corner. So while we're in the intersection, and we're not going to be standing in the middle of the intersection, obviously we're going to be standing on the sidewalk. But while you're there and you can move around, take note of how far away that gas station is and the short distance that the tow truck driver had to bring the car. And once we've spent enough time considering all of these, then we're going to be going to another address. You're going to hear a testimony about a lot of different addresses where the defendant brought Harmony's body afterwards. We're not going to be going to the first two addresses that one that involves, you'll hear it involves a deck, another one that involves a red cooler. We're not going to be here, we're not going to be driving by one on Lake Avenue as well that you'll hear testimony later on about where he stored Harmony in the ceiling. Where we're going to go is 644 Union Street. So from this intersection, we'll come back to, onto the buses, onto Webster, come over to Union Street, and head south. And the intersection of 640, 644 Union Street is right at the intersection of Union and Orange. The so Orange is the cross street. You're going to see two buildings. We're going to be stopping right outside here, 644 Main. Testimony that you will, later, you will hear later on involves also a parking lot that's general in the back. But here, we're not going to be getting off the buses. You're not going to have to go inside. <coughs> we're going to ask you to, again, look out the right-hand side of the buses and the size of the building. While you're there, we're going to ask you to please take a look at the number of apartments that are there, the number of neighbors that the defendant would have had based upon looking at those apartments. Look at the traffic, look at the light, look at the neighborhood. Later on, you're going to hear more testimony about that apartment and what took place in that apartment. Again, we will not be getting out of the buses. You do not have to go in that apartment. When we're done at Union Street, the buses will pull away We'll come down to Bridge, back onto Elm, back south to Merrimack, and then back to the courthouse. I'm going to ask you to look at one last thing on this drive. As we come back to the intersection of Merrimack Street and Elm, roughly here compared to how I'm pointing right now, down at that intersection, Right across the street from each other, there's the Thirsty Moose Tap House, which is right on Merrimack. Right across the street from that is a Chase Bank right now. When we drive back down Elm, and then we take that left-hand turn to come up Merrimack Street to come back to the courthouse, I'm going to ask you to look out the right-hand bus of the window. We're not going to be slowing down there. It's Elm Street, a little too busy. But I do want you to look out to <coughs> that Chase Bank. In the winter of 2020, you will hear testimony that that was not a bank that that was the Portland Pie Company pizza shop, that that was where the defendant worked. And you're going to also hear testimony that that was where, on one occasion, he ordered his wife to bring a CMC bag containing Harmony's body and stored it inside a freezer, seen by other witnesses. So when you hear those witnesses and they talk about Portland Pie Company, we're going to be driving by that location. Again, it's a bank now. It's not a pizza place anymore but understand where that location is to be at better understand the testimony that you're going to hear throughout the rest of this. And let me stress again, what you see on this view is going to be evidence. The locations we're stopping at, the Habit Methadone Clinic, the Burger King up on Daniel Webster Highway, coming back to Colonial Village where we'll get out, to the intersection of Elm and Webster, where we will also get out. The drive by 644 Union Street, and then back to Elm, and the drive by what was Portland Pie Company before we come back to the courthouse. This will be your only opportunity, as you heard from the court, to 
to look at these places in person until the end of this trial. So take the time. If you need more time, please let the court staff know. We will stay longer in the parking lot. We will stay longer at the intersection. We have uh, great deputies and bailiffs who will allow you to be able to explore the space in a safe manner um, so that you're not going to feel like you've got traffic right on top of you or anything like that. So do please take your time. But when you listen to the testimony from the different witnesses, these are five of the key locations that you're going to hear. So it's important that you know what they look like in person before you hear that testimony. Based upon that, again, after you hear this and after you see all of the evidence of this case, we'll ask you to return a verdict that is just. Uh, but I would also ask you if you would please uh, do also pay close attention to defense counsel's comments about the view. Because again, the more observations that you can make on today's view, the better it will be for you to understand the testimony you see later on. And it's a one only shot. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> this is where the trial really begins for you, and you literally step into it. You step onto the bus, you go to places. These places are exhibits of your mind. These places in your mind, you apply to everything else that you hear, see, and consider in this case. The state said that this was the last journey that Harmony made. This is where the dispute starts. This is not the journey that Harmony made, but this will be the journey that we make today. And when we leave here and we go to uh, Merrimack Street, that's a clinic. And it is a clinic that um, You'll hear testimony that Adam and Kayla frequented all the time, or quite a bit, and that um, when you're there, I want you to look. We can't recreate what was happening on particular days or particular weeks, who might have been coming and going at what time. So you actually can only look around and see the exposure what is the parking there? What, it, what can you see? What is exposed? What is hidden? Um, and then apply the evidence that you hear about events that may have occurred there or, and consider, is, could this have happened? Put your mind to the testimony and apply it. This is what I saw. This is what I remember. This is what the witness is saying. It is your evidence, but it's evidence in the case. Then you'll go from uh, the clinic to Burger King. And um, at Burger King, that's really very, very important to look at that entire layout. Again, we can't recreate the amount of traffic that was on a particular day or a week. Uh, we can't recreate any of that stuff, but you look at the parking. I want you specifically to look at how that drive through works out when you make the order and then you pay the cashier and then you get your food. Take that into consideration. Take the time to think about a route through the drive through What is exposed? What is hidden? Who can see what from what angle? Think about the cashier. Think about all of the stuff around the drive through and actually when you're there and stop, think about that from the time somebody pulls into the parking area. And again, you will be applying that to somebody else's testimony and then you'll be thinking and applying that. Does this work? Does this not work? What's going on here? It is your um, evidence. Um, from there, uh, you heard that we're going to Colonial Village, and that is a place that you're getting out. So you will take the time, traffic's going to be different from testimony that you hear about, but you want to look what is exposed, what is hidden. 
from particular places looking at the building. What can you see? What can't you see? We're going to direct you to particular places and areas and say, take a look and consider from this perspective something that pictures can never quite do. And you got to hold it in your mind and again, apply it to testimony as it comes in. This is an exhibit throughout the trial, not just for this afternoon. Uh, from the Colonial, uh, you will go to Elm and Webster, which is a place that you're going to get out. And that is really critical on traffic because, again, it can't be recreated. But there is going to be testimony about traffic, about reaction to traffic. There's a car that's broken down there and about uh, what people did about the car, about what traffic was like because the car was broken down. And you want again, look, what's exposed, what is hidden, and apply your exhibit in your head to the testimony that comes here at trial. Then, uh, Fit Shelter is uh, the next place, and you're going to hear about information that happened inside Fit, Sh Fit Shelter. So you won't have that sort of same perspective of uh, what's exposed and what's not exposed, because you won't actually see that part. And there's testimony about Fit Shelter that is very disturbing, but you still need to go there so that you put it in place about the type of place that it is. And an objection? I'm sorry, I think, I think there's an objection. <laughs> essentially withdraw. Messing up my words, Union Avenue. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you will not be going into Union Avenue, but some very disturbing things occurred at Union Avenue, so you want to hold this into your head. Think about the building. Think about the location. Remember Union Avenue, even though you can't go into it, and I think you'll be very happy that you don't go into it. All of this is an exhibit inside of your head, and keep the names a little bit better than I did. I'm so sorry about that. But the location is the same, and this is the journey that we are taking. And at the end from Union Avenue, you're going to come back here, and as they say, pass by um, the corner at Merrimack and Elm. Keep that in mind. I also want you to keep in mind the distance from the two. Distance in this case is a little bit less important, but still something to keep in mind. As a person testifies about traveling from place to place, about how long does it take, the traffic lights, what is a delay. And I did forget it. Each of those traffic lights, I want you to look around again, just as you're going through the traffic lights, what's exposed, what is hidden. You're going to be on streets. Assume that everything on the street is exposed. Look around on the sidewalks and the areas around it as well. Um, it's a difficult thing. Again, you're not taking notes. And you're going to have to remember this as you apply it to all of the testimony in this case. All of these locations are important, not necessarily for the reasons that the state said. There is a dispute going on here, but there is no dispute that all these locations are very, very important. 
then uh, we can only ask you to pay attention as best you can. When we get there, we'll just remind you of perspective and specific areas to look at. I believe that we'll be uh, going behind you to make sure that the bus stops long enough to you, for you to um, absorb all of the areas before you go to the next one, before you go to the next one, until you step out and actually walk around, starting at Colonial Village. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that concludes the preview statements. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to send you back into the jury deliberation room. This is a good time to use the restroom, have a drink of water. Uh, I think we've got a little bit of time before the bus arrives. Uh, we will let you know uh, when the bus arrives, and you'll be escorted by the court officers. Uh, I will be on the bus with you as well as uh, some of the court staff. Uh, the lawyers will be going separately. So. Um, just be patient as soon as the bus is ready for us and all of our business here is concluded, we will go ahead and get on the bus and begin the view. All right, uh, the reminder about not talking about uh, the case with each other or with anyone else or doing any independent research, uh, make sure you don't do that, okay? All rise for the jurors, please. Council.
you admit to each and every element of the offense of falsifying physical evidence and abuse of corpse. Is that yes. accurate? Okay. And did you, yes. did you speak with your lawyers in detail about that? Yes, I did. And uh, have you reviewed the opening statement in which they will tell that to the jurors? Yes, I did. And um, do you wish for them to acknowledge your guilt on both of those charges, falsifying physical evidence and abuse of corpse? Yes. And do you understand that it would be the state's obligation to prove each and every element of those offenses beyond a reasonable doubt before the jury could find you guilty? Do you understand that? Yes. And that by uh, agreeing to allow them to acknowledge this in opening statements, uh, the, the jurors can find you guilty of those two offenses uh, relying yes. on that information. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay, and that is what you wish to do? Yes, ma'am. Okay, do you have any further question about that? No, I do not. All right, uh, anything further that the state request? Nothing that's further the state request. We, we assume that the court would take that into account and make a decision whether or not he's making a knowing, intelligent, and voluntary waiver of uh, essentially proof of his facts and proceeding this way, which the court will do. Okay, um, so anything you want to add, Attorney Smith? Not on that issue. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Montgomery, having heard from you that you've discussed this with your lawyers, that you've reviewed the opening statements, uh, the draft of the opening statement, that you acknowledge that you understand that the burden of proof is on the state to prove uh, each of those offenses beyond a reasonable doubt, and that it, understanding uh, that it is your desire for them to proceed with that strategy, the court does find that this is a knowing, intelligent, and voluntary waiver uh, of your rights, and will allow them to proceed on that basis. Okay. Oh, yep. Okay. Um, so. Uh, while I have you, um, today you did refuse transport, so I want to talk to you about tomorrow. As we discussed with you this morning, you can't change your mind midway through the day, uh, but you can inform the court if you wish to come tomorrow, uh, and what I would like to do, and each day thereafter. So you can come, and we will send a transport for you. That is your absolute right. Uh, but as I explained to you this morning, it's also your right uh, to to waive your presence and for us to proceed in your absence. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to instruct the sheriff's office and the Department of Corrections that someone will ask you tomorrow morning, do you wish to come to court today? Uh, we will have transport available to you if you want to come, but I am not inclined to send a car up there to pick you up, only to have you refuse. Um, so do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you have any concern about that procedure? No, I do not. Okay. Um, so it is our intention to have someone ask you tomorrow morning whether or not you wish to come. And whenever they come to ask you that question, they're going to need an answer from you uh, so that we have sufficient time to make sure that we uh, get you down here in order for us to start the trial in a timely manner. Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and I believe your your counsel will be speaking to you later at some point later today. Not today. Oh, not today. We can't. Okay. Um, Twenty four hour notice. Okay. Um, so uh, that's going to be the procedure for tomorrow morning and each day thereafter of this trial, unless and until the court makes a different order on that. Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, is there anything further from the state while Mr. Montgomery is present? No, Your Honor. Okay. Anything further from the defense? No, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Montgomery, uh, you're free to go now. I appreciate that uh, that you are speaking with us when we need to speak with you because we are keeping the jurors waiting when we do this. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. You're all set. All right. Uh, counsel, we will wait to hear when the bus is here. As soon as the bus is here, um, I guess I'll just have you all notified. Yes. Yes, I know. Oh, the bus is not here. Right. When we thank, thank you, Peter. Um, when the bus is here, uh, let us know so that we can gather everybody up and make sure everybody's in their respective vehicles at the right time. Uh, 
So we'll have somebody, well, the, probably the court officer will check in with you. I'll get on the bus uh, with the court staff and the jurors when, you know, when we get the go ahead from everybody. Sure. Okay. All right, very good. Let me know if you need me before that. Uh, Attorney Ogadi? Yes, ma'am. Counsel?
Um, so just in terms of Mr. Montgomery's refusal to appear today, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue an order that indicates that approximately an hour prior to his transport uh, time from the New Hampshire State, the New Hampshire State Prison shall ask Mr. Montgomery whether he will be accepting or refusing transport. If Mr. Montgomery informs New Hampshire State Prison officials that he will accept the transport, uh, then transport will be informed and they'll immediately go up to the prison to get him, okay? Um, so that would mean he would be here um, on time. If he refuses transport, the sheriff's office will be notified and transport vehicle will not be sent to New Hampshire State Prison. The New Hampshire State Prison shall notify the sheriff's office and provide documentation of the refusal to the court. Uh, the, this process will continue each day throughout the trial and through the verdict um, until, unless and until there's further order of the court. Okay, and I just wanted to go through that with you because if you do speak to Mr. Montgomery tonight, you can let him know that that's the order I'm going to issue. We'll need to communicate with the, the court will need to communicate with the prison, but I, that's what I, that's the order I'm going to issue and that's what I expect will happen, okay? Um, all right, I think uh, I've asked them to come back at 8.45 tomorrow morning. I've given them uh, the communication instruction. I told them that if their regular route home involves driving by any locations that we drove by today, that they can take their regular route, but they're not to you know, pay any extra attention to those areas that we were in today. Right? Anything from this, that the state feels we should cover? Um, I guess uh, two different parts, Your Honor. First of all, with regards to um, the uh, instruction and the order on transport, no, uh, the state entirely agrees. Um, been two separate, and just for the record, there's been two separate colloquies with the court, uh, between the court and Mr. Montgomery today. Uh, it certainly seems that he is very clear in his intentions of what he wants to do and what he does not. The state accepts that and, and doesn't challenge that in any way. Um, and, uh, and we agree with the court's plan on how to deal with that moving forward. Um, um, I think one of the two things that the, the state just wants to bring up is, is tomorrow morning, I know we're going to have the jurors back here for 8.45. Um, what time might the courtroom be open and what time would you like to start with opening arguments just so we can make sure the rest of the technology is going to work and it's in an appropriate location? Okay, so what I expected, what I told the jurors is be back here at 845. Uh, if all goes according to plan, that we would begin openings at 9. Okay. okay? Um, if everybody's here and everybody's ready before 9, then we would start before 9, but uh, 9 would be the certainly the go time, okay, absent some extraordinary circumstance, given the number of circumstances we had today, it would be great if somebody from uh, each side can be here a little earlier, even if it's just one of you, because one of you can communicate with the other via phone if necessary, so that's fine, I think you have a longer distance to travel. Actually, I have no idea how far you come, so, um, so just being here a little early, let me see what, uh, what time will the, can the courtroom be open? Open at 7:45. What about the courtroom? Oh, whenever you tell me. Maybe um, 8:30, Your Honor, if that's available. Oh, definitely. And I'll just at least give us 15 minutes before the 8:45 time to make sure things are ready. Um, that sounds great, and that way, if you can, if defense can also be here on that a little bit earlier side, so that we can just confirm that everybody's comfortable with where the technology is. Um, that would be great. Not You don't have to come that early, but I just want to do it so that we can get an on-time start, and if we need to move things around, we can. Uh, it does look like we have two podiums, so that's good. You'll have your witnesses lined up and ready to go for a full day. Yes, uh, we're going to be speaking with our uh, advocate just in a few minutes as soon as we get done this hearing, Your Honor, and we'll be able to hopefully provide that list to defense counsel uh, before they leave the courthouse. Um, so we just need a couple of minutes. I know typically we always make sure it's done by 6 p.m. I think we'll be able to, to be earlier than that. Um, I guess just to bless you. Um, I think just separate from that, Your Honor, um, one thing that I'm looking through the inner office memorandum you stated uh, regarding, I'll just let me slow down, uh, Lieutenant Burke's write-up of the, uh, excuse me, Sergeant Fulamont's write-up of the interaction today. You stated uh, earlier on that this is something that typically would be filed in court uh, regarding Transport. Well, I don't know. When I know that 
when we have that from the House of Correction, I don't know if we, if it gets transmitted by the House of Correction to the court and the court puts it in the file or whether that must be, that must be the way it happens. Um, so we, we, so we can put this in the file as we, as we do, you know, uh, with that, but the House of Correction is not a memo, it's just a defendant refused. Sometimes it has some explanation on it, but it's not quite like that. So that's why I would like you to confer with each other. I don't see any reason why it can't be uploaded. But I, see, and I think the state's position is going to be that it should be uploaded in the memo. Certainly the facts that were in there were taken into account when considering the defendant's call of police today. Um, so uh, certainly the defense counsel should have an opportunity to talk about it amongst themselves, but it is the state's position that this should be on. Say anything about that, or you want to take some time to read it more carefully? You just got it, so right. I, I think that there's new information on there that sort of falls into some of the concerns that I addressed earlier this morning. So, yes, I'd like some more time with it. Okay, um, so all right, anything else you wanted to raise? No, yeah. all right. Uh, thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow morning. If something else, I'll issue this order today. If anything comes up, please let the court know, and we'll make sure that we get a chance to communicate about it. Okay. Thank you. All right.